Good morning. It's so good to see all of you here today for worship on this beautiful September morning. I don't know about in your yards, but I'm starting to see a few leaves changing, and so um, I'm excited about fall that's coming very soon. No, not yet? No. We have a tulip poplar, and it likes to shed its leaves early. So anyway, I'm glad you're here for this worship service this day, and those who are at home we and worshiping with us, we're glad you have joined us too. So now, as we um, center our thoughts and minds and listen in silence to, to Sue as she plays the prelude, let us now focus on worship.
I invite you now to open your worship guide as we read responsibly our call to worship. We gather today to worship the one who created us. The, the one, one who called us. The one who equips us. The, the one who loves us without end. With, with joyful God. hearts, let us worship God. Bow with me in prayer. Our oh Lord God and Heavenly Father, as we pause for just a few moments in the busyness of our lives, we often omit and not take the time to give you all the praise and glory. But we come this day offering up to you with sincere hearts as we gather in your place at this time. We gather as brothers and sisters in Christ with the desire that you would be lifted up. And through prayer, through music, through the reading of your word and your inspired message, we present to you this day. Lord, accept these things as we gather in your name. For it's in Christ we do pray. Amen. I invite you to stand as we sing hymn 415, Lift High the Cross. Be seated.
I'm a teacher. <laughs> Sorry. Normally Heather calls and says, you've got scripture. So today we will be looking at uh, Matthew 4, 18 through 22. As he walked by the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, who was called Peter, and Andrew, his brother, casting a net into the sea. And for they were fishermen. And he said to them, follow me, and I will make you fish for people. Immediately they left their nets and followed him. As he went from there, he saw two other brothers, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, in the boat with their father Zebedee, mending their nets, and he called them. Immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. And this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. I'd like to invite our children to come down front for children's time. Good morning. How are you guys doing? Can I sit in between you? Okay. All right. All right. So did you hear the story that your grandmother just read? Do you know what was Jesus doing? Do you remember? Okay. Well, let me tell you. He was walking along. Yeah, that's right. He saw two brothers. And what were the brothers doing? Fishing. That's right. Okay. So I have to ask you, have you ever been fishing? Yes. Did you catch a fish? How big was that fish? <laughs> was it? Are you sure? Yeah. What do you think, Mom? I caught a fish like that. Yeah, that's that's usually about. Usually, my fish are like a catch about this big. Yeah. Well, there were there were two sets of brothers. Simon Peter and his brother Andrew, and then another set of brothers. James and John, and their dad was named Zebedee. Zebedee, that's right, Zebedee. And they were fishing, and Jesus was walking along, and he said, hey, why don't you put down your nets and come and follow me, and I will make you fishers of people or men. And what what does that mean? What did did Jesus mean? I will make you fishers of people. Are they going to, like, go and catch somebody on a hook and reel them in? No? They're, they're going to fish for people. They're going to fish in the lake. Okay, all right, that's a good guess. All right, do you think, what do you think that means? Do you have any idea? Yeah. Yeah. You're going to catch fish? Okay, well, it could have something to do with that. But what I think what Jesus is talking about is they're going to fish for people, meaning they're going to follow Jesus, and they're going to tell people about Jesus and Encourage them to follow Jesus. They're going to catch them, bring them in, and encourage them to be Christians and follow Jesus. Does that make sense? They're not really going to reel them in with a hook and line and um, fishing and pole, and they're really not going to feed them fish, but they're going to encourage them to follow Jesus. So those two sets of brothers, they, they left behind everything they knew and followed Jesus. They were very brave, don't you think? They left behind their families and their jobs and took off walking behind Jesus and following him. Like, if you look on the front page, let me show you this picture right here. See? See those people right there? See, they're all following Jesus. Yeah. So that's, yeah. So that's what we're called to do, too. We are called to follow Jesus. And when we can be brave and follow Jesus, too. What are some ways that we can um, follow Jesus? Yes. Go to church. Go to church. That's right. Very very good. What else can we do? Mm-hmm. Be kind. Be kind. Yep. You know, say say your prayers. Right. That's right. Treat other people the way you want to be treated. All those things are following Jesus. And you can tell people about Jesus' love for them too. Well, we're going to sing the song. Um, your grandma and grandpa are going to help us sing. No, not to make fishers. Yeah, the children's song. Not that one yet. We're going to do that one in a minute. We're singing two songs today about fishermen. But we're going to sing the children's song about about fishermen, okay? So they're going to help us sing. And everybody, y'all can sing along too, okay? It's not what's on the screen. We're not doing that one yet. 
You remember, we have to do this when we sing that song, right? Like we're fishing, right? All right, very good. Well, will you pray with me, guys? Thank you. Let's, let's pray together. Dear God, help us to follow you and help us to love others as you love them. Help us to be fishers of men. Amen. All right, thank you. You can go back to your seats. I invite you now to pull out the insert that's in your worship guide as we sing Two Fishermen, the adult version. <laughs> Sue's going to play it through one time just so you can hear the tune. stand. Two fishermen who lived along the Sea of Galilee stood by the shore to cast their nets into an ancient sea. Now Jesus watched them from afar and called them each by name. They changed their lives, they served for men, they'd never be the same. Leave all things you have Will you please pray with me? God, in whom our lives find meaning, by whom our lives are sustained, we offer to you our praise and thanksgiving, for you alone are the creator of the universe. Before this world existed, you were God. And before time began, you were God. 
but you have chosen to know us and to call us by name, to love us and care for us and to become as we are, to suffer the pain that we feel. It is a wonder and a mystery, and while we cannot profess to understand it all, we do give thanks for your grace and your presence. But there are some for whom the mystery of life has turned dark and threatening. There are those who wonder why, in a world able to sustain us all, they must go hungry. There are those who are locked into a prison of poverty, and they wonder how they will ever escape. And there are those who suffer, those who suffer from illness, those who suffer in body and spirit, those who suffer the cold pangs of fear and anxiety and the persistent pain of worry. And there are those who suffer the agony of questions that have no answers. For these and so many more, we pray. And we confess, O oh God, that sometimes we have tried to offer answers that were too easy rather than living with the uncertainty of questions. So forgive us when we try to reduce you to something more manageable than mysterious. And forgive us when we try to fit you into our lives, rather than finding our lives in you. Help us to be your disciples, to leave all things behind, and come and follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
Thank you, Brad, Stu, and choir. And thank you all for singing the Two Fishermen song. Did you like that? I think Brad said it sounds like Gilligan's Island. No. No, we're going to, we're actually going to, the, the last verse of that song is going to be our closing song for the next number of weeks because we're starting a brand new sermon series entitled, you saw it when you came in, What Disciples Not Believe, But What Disciples Do. So I want to welcome these folks who are worshiping from home this day with us. Um, Karen McMillan, who's in South Carolina, Jim Fox in Winchester, Michelle Medlin and her daughter Erin, they say good morning from Kansas, Mike and Diane Goodwin in Florida, Carl Ponstingle, he says good morning from the Roanoke Valley, Mike and Sandy Fennerfrock in Pennsylvania, Sarah Clemen, Renee Pittman, and also Jean Allen. We are so glad that you all have joined us today. Also, I would like to welcome Marie and Tony Hendricks. Um, they are the grandparents of Lindsay Culpepper, who was our college student that was here this summer. And so they're in Alabama, and they um, have been watching and worshiping with us online. So we're glad you all have joined us too. So our scripture lesson is another gospel passage from Luke chapter 14. I'm going to be reading verses 25 to 33. Now large crowds were traveling with Jesus, and he turned and said to them, Whoever comes to me and does not hate father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and even life itself cannot be a disciple. Whoever does not carry the cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down and estimate the cost to see whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid the foundation, is not able to finish it, all who see it will begin to ridicule him, saying, This fellow began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king going out to wage war against another king will not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to oppose the one who comes against him with 20,000? If he cannot, then while the other is still far away, he sends a delegation and asks for the terms of peace. So therefore, none of you can become my disciple if you do not give up all your possessions. Will you please pray with me? Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So the name of our sermon today is All In. On Thursday, I heard the most interesting story on National Public Radio. The host and the guest were talking about one way to help us understand the political turmoil going on in our country. One way to understand that turmoil is to look at our history as a country. The historian was arguing that our country has faced similar challenges before, and those lessons can shed a light on how to help us build a stronger, more vibrant democracy. One thing he said that caught my attention was how people need something to belong to in which they can create community. In years past in the United States, people flocked to churches to form their identities. Think about it, those of you who've grown up in the church, Church was open many days and nights for all kinds of activities. Sunday morning, Bible study, Sunday school and worship. Sunday night, discipleship training, and then you had worship again. Monday nights, visitation, where you'd go out and visit guests and also go visit those who were sick. Wednesday night, supper, Bible study, mission groups, choir for all ages, handbells. And then on other nights, y'all remember WMU and Brotherhood? And if you were a child, maybe Act Teens. 
Well, that, and then, and that was what the community was centered around, was around church. And when you met someone for the first time, within the first few sentences of introduction, people often said what church they attended. So I'm going to pretend like I'm Shane, um, since he's not here today. I would say, hi, I'm Shane Goodwin. I work for Warren County Schools, and I'm married with two semi-adult children. And I attend First Baptist Church, because it was part of your introduction. What church you attended was an important part of who you were. So the historian said that people were shaped by their identity from the churches. They formed their values, and they created the community within that local church. Well, now, as you know, not a lot of people are attending church, but they still need to find their identity and their community somewhere. So what he was asserting is that people's political affiliations has become people's community. People are choosing to associate and identify solely with their political party. Isn't that interesting? In other words, I would, if my name was Joe, I would say, hi, I'm Joe, I'm a doctor or a mechanic, whatever, and I'm a Republican or Democrat. You see, that has become our identity, and I think it's become people's primary identity, so many people, and I think that's really what is dividing us into little camps, little camps of people who can't get along. So speaking of little camps, when one is born in South Carolina, one is born into either a University of South Carolina Gamecock family or a Clemson University Tiger family. Now, at baby showers, babies are given little onesies, either in garnet and black for the Gamecocks or purple and orange for the Tigers. Now, my parents... Even though they born and bred in South Carolina, they did not go to either school. No one in our family did. My mom went to Winthrop College, which was the teacher's college. My dad went to Furman and then to Georgia Tech. So when I was growing up, we watched Georgia Tech football and even some basketball. Maybe you remember Bobby Crimmins? Remember those days? So I went to Furman along with my brother, my dad, and then Paige. And, and what we say, if you've been to Furman, is that we are the rose between those two thorns. <laughs> However, being from South Carolina, you're supposed to identify with either of those schools, USC or Clemson. And, and I always say I just identify with whoever's winning. But I want to tell you a Clemson Tiger story today. So it was October 13th, 2008. It was a Monday at 4 o'clock, to be exact. About partially into the football season, I think they had played maybe four games. Maybe a few more, maybe six. Well, that morning, longtime Clemson head football coach Tommy Bowden was fired, and his wide receivers coach, Dabo Sweeney, was informed that he was now the interim head coach with a legitimate chance to earn the job full-time. So Sweeney at the time was only 38. He was quite a youngster. And he met with his team that day, and he said, the next six weeks are going to be really tough, but I'm all in. And he added that only those in the room who were all in should bother showing up at football practice later that afternoon. Everyone did show up. And that phrase, all in, has become a phrase that Clemson players and fans use to show that they are 100% behind Dabo Sweeney and his team. Now, if you were to ask folks today what they are all in for, very few people would say, I'm all in for Christ. And for those of us who do say that we are all in for Jesus Christ, what do we really mean? Because if you look closely at this passage of scripture I just read, Jesus is asking us to do some really hard things. Hate our families? Carry a cross that could lead to our death? And give up our possessions? That is crazy, utterly crazy. 
I love my family. I don't want to die on a cross. And I really do like my stuff. Well, clearly, faithful discipleship and following Jesus is not for the faint of heart. Jesus uses very strong language to spell out the high cost of discipleship. It must be a total dedication that moves us from wish to careful deliberation and decision making. Being all in with Jesus cannot be done on impulse because Jesus knows that crosses could be potentially in the future for his followers. Now, back in the days of early Christianity, becoming a Christian was not something that was taken lightly. It was a deliberate decision made over many weeks of conversation with other Christians. It was made through many weeks of prayer and study. And that is clearly not what happens at revivals or crusades or at the end of a long week at youth camp where decisions to follow Jesus are made because of some really good preaching tugging at a listener's heartstrings. Back in the day when I was a youth minister, I took our teenagers to Unidiversity Youth Camp each summer. It was a camp that was planned by 15 youth ministers, and we all took our teenagers to the camp. And we had decision night on the next to last night of camp, because the last night of camp was always the dance. So we did decision night on the next to the last night. And we all knew what to expect, lots of kids coming down the aisle, lots of tears and emotions. And for many young people, this was a pivotal experience in their walk of faith with Christ. We were able to go back home and as youth ministers build on that foundation and help them to grow in Christ. Well, the youth ministers, we would all come and we would line the front to be down there to greet the students as they came down the aisle. So many of the children, the young people that came, they would rededicate their lives to Christ. And we had some who had never made a decision to follow Jesus, so we would talk with them. But one time I was down there, and there was a young person that came down the aisle, and I asked her, but tell me about your decision. Well, she was crying, and it was the wet, sloppy kind of crying, you know, with the runny nose, all of that. And she said, well, I'm here because, well, I'm here because all my friends came down, and I thought I needed to also. And that was that. Now, all of this to say is that following Jesus is so much, much more than just a one-time decision to follow Jesus. It's a lifetime commitment. It's a lifetime of being all in. It's a lifetime of being called to think and to do hard things. It's not a walk in the park. It's not all sunshine, ice cream, and puppy dogs. It is very, very difficult. Discipleship takes time and involves lots of trial and error. It involves lots of false starts and modest successes. And as we grow in our faith journeys, we slowly begin to live fully into who we were created to be by God. We begin to live the holiness that resides within us. We learn to face life's challenges and joys with a spirit of love, hope, faith, and peace. And all of this is leading us to a fuller and deeper spirituality and a life of prophetic witness. The year was 2005. I can remember watching TV on my couch in the den in horror at the devastation of Hurricane Katrina. I cried as I watched people dying because of the slow response of our government. And then there were so many inept attempts by our federal government to rebuild New Orleans in the Gulf Coast. It was so devastating. Do you remember? So what were churches to do. Many people of faith traveled to that area. Many groups went and repeatedly offered their skills to help. 
Our South Carolina church sent a college, group of college students during their spring break. I took a group of 50 adults and teenagers to Mobile, Alabama, including Nancy Wendell, who was 80 years old at the time. She went. Her job was to hand out cold, iced-down towels so that the workers could have that around their necks. We worked with Habitat for Humanity. We built, we worked on 14 Habitat houses that were on a, ro a row. It was a, a, a row, a street, where all the houses had been destroyed, and we were rebuilding them with hurricane standards that could withstand a hurricane. And then one week before, right after the storm, our church put a family from New Orleans in one of the houses that our church owned right next to our church. Many, many Jesus followers came alive in faith and followed Jesus to help those in need. The good news of the gospel was spread through the act of witness in helping those who had been and continued to be brutalized by poverty. Those who went were following the call of Jesus. In the process of becoming disciples, we must learn to give up all of our possessions, our need to acquire, our yearning for success, our stereotypes of others, our prejudice and our hatreds, and much, much more. We must examine our thoughts, our words, and our actions and see what keeps us from becoming the Christ-like person that Christ is inviting us to be, an invitation for us to be all in. At the heart of discipleship is transformation. The cost of discipleship is not just becoming accumulators of new information about faith and figuring out what we believe, nor is it acting on the teachings of Jesus. Instead, the cost of discipleship is engaging in a profoundly radical shift toward the ethics of Jesus with every fiber of our being. There is no driftwood in discipleship. No one can just drift along with the ebb and flow of the tide, being unintentional about following Jesus. We are called to live lives of complete devotion to God. We are called to be all in. Jesus reminds us in today's passage that following him means that we cannot be shallow or uncommitted believers Driftwood, shallow, uncommitted. These words cannot proceed the noun of disciple. No driftwood disciples. No shallow disciples. No uncommitted disciples. The words that should precede the word disciple are all in. All in disciples. I get so excited when I think about this, y'all. Imagine how our world would change if everyone who is a disciple of Jesus became all in disciples. Our world would be so different than it is now. So much more loving, so much more generous, and so much more empathetic. Being an all-in disciple means that we enter into an intimate relationship with God in Christ that teaches us that obedience to God is not blind. It is a thought-provoking, deliberate process in which we grow in our ability to ask the tough questions about life and living, not only of God, but of ourselves. This intimate relationship invites us into mature faith. Discipleship involves salvation, but it also involves transformation. Do you know about the nuns and the duns? Have y'all heard of this? So nuns, not N-U-N, but N-O-N, nuns, are people with no faith. And then duns are people who have left the church. They're done with faith. And both of these are on the rise in our country, the nuns and the duns. But what is the biggest threat to Christianity today? Martin Thillen said that, says that the biggest threat to the Christian faith in America 
It's not the fact that we are becoming more secular as a country, and it's not that, not that there are lots of nuns and duns, and those are growing. The biggest threat to vibrant faith in the United States is nominal Christianity. Shallow and non-committal faith does not breed vital followers or congregations. Who would be attracted to such a lame faith? As one young man said, if all my religion is going to do is change my Sunday schedule, then I'm not interested. He said, I want something that's going to change my finances, my sex life, the way I work, the way I treat my family, the way I treat others, the way I use my time. He is so very right. Being all in, being an all in disciple should impact every part of our lives. How we spend our money, how we treat our family and friends and co-workers and neighbors, how we use our time. It should affect how we treat our environment, God's creation. It should impact how we treat those who find themselves in poverty. All in Faith impacts our character, our ethics, our values. Friends, we are called to take our faith extremely seriously. We don't just follow Jesus down the aisle crying and follow him. We don't just follow Jesus because it's culturally the thing to do. And we don't just follow Jesus because it's what our families have always done. We follow knowing that it will cost us. It will cost us everything. Everything. Are you willing to count the cost? Are you willing to follow Jesus wherever he leads? Are you willing to be all in? May it be so in our lives. Amen. So let's spend a few moments of silent reflection thinking about what it means to be an all-in disciple. Holy God, help us as we seek to follow you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. As we prepare our hearts for communion, I invite you to stand and sing communion hymn 459, Come Share the Lord, as we prepare our hearts to meet Christ at the table. Let's stand and sing together.
Please be seated. All in disciples need moments to refresh and recharge and prepare for the week ahead. That is what we do on Sundays, and it's what this table is for. It gives us the nourishment that we need to look forward to the work that we have to do. So will you please pray with me? Forgive us, O oh Lord, for sometimes we are an impatient people. We seek a faith that produces immediate results. We seek a way that is quick and quickly done with. But that is not your way. For you have called us to journey. A journey that's measured not in moments, but in lifetimes. You work in us by a slow and sometimes hidden grace. So help us to be patient, O Lord, and faithful along the way. And may this bread and this cup give us strength and nourishment for the long journey of faith. In your name we pray. Amen. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. And in the same way, he took the cup, poured it, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant. It's my blood. It's shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. So we are going to invite you to come. We will have two deacons. We'll start in our north wing. Please go clockwise. The deacon will hand you the bread and hand you juice. Go ahead and take the bread and take the juice, um, either as you stand in front of the deacon or as you go back to your seat. And there's also some trash cans for your cups if you drink up here. Um, and then those deacons will move to the north wing, so y'all hang on for just a second. And then here in the middle, um, y'all come down the middle aisle and take the bread and cup and then go back to your seats. And the choir will be served up there. So now let us all come together and celebrate the risen Lord.
prayer that Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. It is time for our hymn of response. We're going to sing, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus, which is number 497. And I'll be down front. If anyone would like to learn about what it means to be an all-in disciple and follow Jesus, we would love to have you join us, either as a first-time Christian or um, if you would like to become a member of our church, we would love to have you. So please now let us stand and sing together hymn number 497. weeks ago, I left my studio one Sunday morning about 7.45 with a Jeep full of gear, as I always do, to stop here first, set up a couple things, plug in something, so later I don't have to move Shane and Michael out of the way. That's the truth. You go next door and set up the rest. That particular morning had all the ingredients of a perfect day. The sun was shining. Some fluffy clouds were floating by in the sky. The temperature was perfect. Not too hot, not too chilly. It was a gentle breeze blowing, birds were singing, people were cheery, people were cheery at the diner, but for some reason I just wasn't feeling it that day. So I prayed on the way here, I said, Lord, I'm feeling kind of empty today, I don't know why, but I need for you to fill me up and bless the songs I'm about to play and may they, if they don't touch anybody else, touch me in a special way. And the sermon that I will hear in a few hours, may it touch me deep down inside. And whether in times of discouragement or when things are very well with me, I find great comfort in talking to my Heavenly Father. And it never fails every time. He listens because he's concerned about everything that's going on in my life. And I love him for that. I haven't repeated any song that I've sung here at all this year, but this one keeps coming back and I just can't get around it for some reason. And uh, maybe that reason is you today. He's all I need when I just need someone to talk to. He's always there to hear my prayer each time I call him. All my needs, he will supply my thirsty soul. He'll satisfy, he's the Lord of all, and he's all I need. He comforts me when I'm weary. Every pain 
fills my deepest longing time and time again he's my soul's inspiration my heart's consolation he's my everything and he's all I need he's all I need I dare not turn a friend that sticks closer than a brother and on this friend I can rely to give me strength as life goes by he's the Lord of all and he's all I need My deepest longing time and time again is my soul's inspiration, my heart's consolation. He's my everything and he's all I Yes, he's my everything, and he's all I Let's pray. Dear God, you are the Lord God Almighty. There is no one like you. And we've been challenged this morning from your word to be all in in our faith and in our service and in our, in our walk with you. And we ask now, Lord, that as we leave this place and that we will be all in, We've also heard that you're all we need, and that is so true. And we thank you for that message. And we've come to a time where we say thanks for the gifts that we've been able to, to give today. And we ask that you take these offerings, these sacrifices, the tithes, the, the money that has been given, and we ask that you would bless it. And in the same way that you took two fish and some pieces of bread and you fed 5,000, that you would take this offering and you would multiply the effectiveness of it and that it would be used to spread the good news of Jesus Christ so that others could be all in for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please be seated for just a moment. Thank you, Dennis. Make sure you look at the announcements in the worship guide. We are having supper starting this Wednesday night, but let... Let Heather and the church office know that you're coming. Uh, Friends Together is going to be starting back, and so we're having a planning meeting coming up. Um, there's information about a church-wide breakfast and a movie night, lots of things going on here, and then also a live concert recording, which is um, at the end of September. So make note of all of those things and put them on your calendars. And we have more cheese, so more cheese to give away. So we've got brie, all kinds of things, so Sue... 
soup, brie and gouda. So it'll be up here. So please take cheese for it for cheese night. One other, um, one thing I need to say about Wednesday night, if you are coming for dinner and you're not helping to, we're still going to serve our community meals from 5 to 6. And then from 6 to 6.30 is when First Baptist folks can come and eat. We would love for you to park behind the fellowship hall and don't go in the kitchen. I mean, you can, but we'll put you to work. But go in the other door. It's the door that's closest to the stage. And the reason we are doing that, if you come to the other door, we will give you a to-go meal, <laughs> the front door. So it'll just be some confusion if we all park. There's not enough room for everybody in that parking lot. So if, if you're coming for dinner Wednesday night, First Baptist folks, and you're going to eat in the fellowship hall with us around the tables, please park in the back lot and come in the door nearest the stage. If you come in the other doors, you're either going to work in the kitchen or you're getting a to-go meal. So we hope that you'll join us Wednesday night at 6 o'clock around the tables for our fellowship meal. And then choir will be right after that. Um, Sue would love to have you join choir. 6.30 or so, the choir, yeah, about 6.30 or so, choir will wander over here um, for practice. So if you would love to sing with a choir, we would love to have you. So, so come, we've got lots of room up here. We've got empty chairs. We've got room for you. So come and sing with us. Will you please stand now for the benediction? Jesus is looking for a few good men, women, and children. Jesus is looking for a few good folks who are willing to take up their crosses and follow. And Jesus is looking for a few good folks who want to be all in disciples. So let it be you and you and you and you and me. Go to love and serve. Amen.